Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Today on the Plant Cunning Podcast, we are thrilled to have herbalist and educator Megan Rhodes. Hi, Megan. How are you today? Hello. I'm great. How are you? Doing well. Doing really well. So we have a traditional first question on the podcast, and it's how did you come to the plant path? Yes. Well, gosh, the long and winding road. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I wasn't a naturally outdoorsy child. I know a lot of people have these amazing stories. Of, I was always in communion with plants. And I had outside mandatory playtime as a child. <laughs> I was always like, no, I'll be inside with my books. I'll be doing my crafts. I'll be reading. But... I sort of always had digestive issues Mm. and as I got older and actually when I went off to uni, my roommate had celiacs and that's when I realized, oh, you mean this thing my gut's always done isn't like an imbalanced thing. That's not what always happens after you have a meal. Mm. So that led me on this big journey of taking responsibility for my own health My mom had brought us to the, we called it back then, the health food store back in, you know, with that particular smell of carob in the air. Yeah, carob. (laughs) Oh my gosh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That like carob and sort of random ancient grains medley smell, which now is like, "Mm," but back then I was like, what is this? Uh (laughs) So she, you know, she had taken us there because she had explored some, some natural remedies But yeah, from uni, I really needed to sort out my gut for myself. So I went on a journey with that, started going to various practitioners and was looking for a herbalist and didn't know it. Mm. So actually the first person I went to was a naturopath, but I thought it was at a herbalist. So I did a bit of work with her and then was like, okay, well, this isn't quite as like plant based, whole plant based as I was really looking for. So then I looked for another herbalist who ended up being a homeopath, which was, you know, a whole other realm of, you know, it's a whole other discipline, isn't it? And then I was like, okay, still not quite what I'm getting at. And then one day I had a Google and I came across a Four Seasons herbalism course on a farm down south outside of London and I was reading the description and it was like you know getting to the root whole plant medicine you know whole person seasonal all of this making remedies from plants and I was like yes 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 this is this thing this so I went on that workshop and my my cousin-in-law actually is also a, a qualified herbalist and I said oh yeah I'm going on this workshop she said oh yeah who's teaching it I said, I, um, I think she's called Annie McIntyre. And my cousin looked at me and said, you do realize she's like one of the most renowned herbalists in the UK, if not the world. And I was like, oh, no, I had no idea. It just looked like a nice course. <laughs> so oh. so I, start, I was really fortunate. I started learning with Annie. And it was just, I mean, after the first season, it was like champagne inside me. Mm. I was working in corporate tech at the time, which I had known for many years already. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And I was just like, this is what I'm here for. This is what I signed up for when I came down here to do something human. This is it. So I got on a qualification course and started doing that alongside continuing to study with Annie, that sort of crossover between Ayurveda and Western herbal medicine, all the while sorting out my gut and, you know, getting to that place where years on, you you forget that you used to feel like that all the time you Mm. almost forget what that felt like i mean it's it's if you had told that to me when i started that journey i would have been like there's no way i've always felt like this i'm always going to feel like this to now like you know you have something that's a little bit cheeky a little bit sneaky and you know every once in a while your gut goes oh i didn't really like that and you go okay and you listen Mm -hmm. But to not have that same experience, I mean, it's it's totally life-changing. And I knew people have got to know about this. And the more I, so I trained as a a clinical practitioner, 
But the more I got involved in that, the more I realized that what I really wanted to do is teach people. So now that that turn on my plant path journey has very much gone down the road of getting this knowledge, these skills into the hands and the homes of everybody because we all used to have it so that we can all have it again. And then, you know what? There's a real, there's a Monty Python Black Knight level emergency, right? <laughs> the arm is off. You're gushing like, you know, red Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah, get in the ambulance. Get the drugs in there. Sew yeah. the arm back on. But otherwise, I'm good, mm -hmm. you know? You can imagine, <laughs> like, the, the services those skilled, caring people could provide yeah. if all of that if all of that system wasn't inundated with people who are you know chronically unwell because we've lost this knowledge so that's it was a bit of a ramble like my path but that's that's how i got on the plant the plant path and that's that's where i'm at now yeah so it's a bit of a bit of a way from carob chips but you know right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a funny observation about the the carob now that you mentioned that i'm like yeah that does smell like every health food store. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, because no one buys it as well, so it's it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's fake chocolate. Right. We all know it, <laughs> right? I know. Don't don't try to call it chocolate. Yeah, my no. mom wouldn't let us eat chocolate for about four years when I was a child, and we only ate carob. And so there's a little bit of like there's some nostalgia with yes. this, for sure, <laughs> but maybe some more complex emotions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it's also really cool that you, you know, found a way to heal your gut after so many years of not thinking that you would ever be able to do that, you know, mm. and I feel like that's a common story for herbalists is, you know, some sort of longstanding health issue that the herbs actually are there for to mm -hmm. help us wrap our heads around. Mm. And um, I also think it's quite a natural progression to go from learning about the herbs to then wanting to share and be a teacher, you know, and mm -hmm. to, to make sure that the herbs get into as many homes as possible. And that knowledge is shared. Cause like you said, we don't have like this tradition of herbal medicine being passed down from our grandparents or our parents very much in Western culture, at least. And so we do have to seek outside teachers and things like that. So I'm curious, like, what is your teaching practice look like these days? Do you do like workshops or do you have a, a program or something like that? Yeah, so I do, I do some seasonal workshops where people either come for one season or they tend to, because you know, the plants like, once you get, once they get into you, you're like, oh, I need more, I need more. So people will come for spring and then the next thing they know, they're coming back for summer and autumn and winter. And I do some smaller ones like a herbal body oiling workshop. We just did this for the Equinox. We were in a yurt with all of these different herb infused oils and we spent 100 minutes in self massage oh, with seven yeah. different oils from head to toe. I mean, and I got to do it twice in one day. Everybody mm -hmm. was, I was like, just drive safely, please drive. <laughs> <laughs> Between floating out and sliding out of the yurt was the, <laughs> was the end of the day with like the fire being tended by someone who wasn't handling oils. So it was brilliant. But I also do a, a year long intensive course which has a couple of different years to it and that's where we've got 12 herbs that we focus on because you know like it's so exciting and then you go oh oh i need to know you know this is book it's got 500 herbs in it yes i must have and i have to memorize them all you know but you're not really getting to know them and then you get overwhelmed and then does that actually integrate into your life so we do 12 herbs we do one herb for a whole week, which I know in, on some spectrums is like, wow, that's a long time. And on other spectrums, it's like, you mean you only, you don't do it for a whole year, just one plant? Yeah, mm -hmm. like it, it's a kind of middle ground. So we do a week with one herb and one taste that goes with that herb. So we really get it in our bodies. And then we go to the next one. And we've got some, you know, in-person gatherings where we then learn the, you know, medicine making skills and whatnot. And then in autumn, winter, we turn inwards and we do the messages from the body. So like the physiology, but then also unpicking the society's messaging and the programming around it with mm. it. So today we did coughs and coughs and congestion, so respiratory messages. Oh, did we get into some deep conversations about actually, you know, 
some of the structures in society at the moment and how is that restricting our self-expression you know it's turning what used to be you know you think of all the like the old literary texts some of, you know some of which many of us had to suffer through in school right war and peace or whatever right could you imagine squishing that into 200 characters on a tweet or something mm -hmm. um you know so the 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 vast expanse of human expression and then of course when we're on the plant path merging that with plant expression and communication that you can explore versus this tiny little window and then we link that to dry repetitive coughs or losing your voice or what so yeah we had some really it was a very fiery conversation today, which was which was exciting. Okay. But yeah, that's that's the core of how I teach now. So that people who you know, I think a lot of people when they start learning about plants, they get excited and they think, Oh, I wanna learn more, I wanna learn more. But then it's like, well, what are my options? I could kind of keep doing these really enjoyable workshops, which are brilliant, and I teach them as well, they're great. Or then I need to sort of do a practitioner qualification and not everybody wants to do the 500 clinic hours and the final paper and you know all of the stuff not everybody wants to set up a practice mm -hmm. a lot of people just want to really feel confident that they know it for themselves for their families for their communities oh. so that's where i'm kind of serving my community around me is is bringing that bringing that to them oh, I, can't, I can't get enough of it I can't. <laughs> can't stop won't stop <laughs> yeah nice. that's great. love that that keep, seems keep doing it yeah it seems like a very important level to be working at too because like as you were saying in the past there are a lot of like the grannies always knew all the different mm -hmm. herbs and all these things and you didn't have to take somebody to the a doctor unless mm -hmm. they had some severe problem that somebody in the family or somebody in the neighborhood couldn't fix mm -hmm. and now you know people want to go to the hospital for a cough <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, and I, I always tell my students, remember, reclaim, relearn. This is, it might feel new, but none of this is new. This is baked into our bodies. You know, think about like the earliest humans who, bless them, are wandering around. I always sort of imagine it a bit as a comic strip. You eat it. No, you eat it and we'll see what happens, you know? <laughs> yeah. But they had to observe animals and what they were self-medicating with they and well just feeding themselves with they had to observe the world around them to understand what was safe and then after what was safe what was helpful supportive and in what context and just like you've got instinct for you know you see you know any like a baby farm animal being born and then they just know you know the the mum starts licking them and then they get nudged and then they stand up and then they start feeding. Yeah. They just, you know, nobody's got to teach them that, right? It's instinctive unless, you know, they're poorly or something's, you know, something's really off. Mm -hmm. So for us, this is why I love taste because you get people to taste the herbs. You don't even tell them what it is. And you say, just drink this tea. What do you think? And they go, oh, you know, it's really warming or oh, it's my, my sinuses have just cleared or oh, my stomach's gurgling now. And I say, okay, well, what do you feel like that would be supportive for you with that herb? And they say, oh, I think it would support with this, that, and the other. And then I'll go, okay, here, I'll read you the bullet point list of the, you know, the herbalism terminology of what this is quote unquote good for. And it's, I mean, they're right. They're right every single time. And everybody goes, do you know, I don't know how I knew that, but I knew that. That makes sense. And I said, yeah, because it's in, it's in your body. Mm. It's in your body. It's a, it's a point of, I feel, it's a point of survival that's been passed down with humans all these generations. And not just that, but because of that, our bodies know what to do, whether we know intellectually or not. You know, you take a herb that's a bitter laxative doesn't matter if you know what it's going to do, it's going to have that effect on you because your body goes, oh, right, okay, now we need to kick off this process and this and this and this, and it will happen because that communication web has not been broken. That's that stayed intact over all the generations, all the different industries, all the different permutations of 
cultures and civilizations and whatever, that's still there. And all you have to do is wake it back up. Yeah, it's that's still there. It is. And I think in this culture, we often privilege like the intellectual level. And, you know, I love the intellectual level. Like, you know, I've got hundreds of books and all, yeah, these, same. You know, all, that, all, that, <laughs> all that stuff. And it's very helpful to clarify things and to analyze things. But we forget that body level of, of knowing. Mm -hmm. often. And we do. And we sort of poo poo it sometimes. Mm -hmm. But we all have that. We can all tap into that. And, mm -hmm. and and when you you read these seems arcane actions in the, in the books, you, you forget that that's actually warming means it's warming, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's like you can taste that, you can feel that yeah. immediately. Yeah, you know? but so, you know, is hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, when you're just looking at it in words in a book, you know, mm -hmm. and you probably whether you're doing it or you're imagining this scene as you're just sitting in some kind of I don't know generic coffee shop but you're sitting there and you're thinking okay i'm at ye oldy desk and i've got my <laughs> candlelight and my quill and i'm reading this tome and i'm taking these notes and oh yes cayenne warming you know for you know which humor or which you know dosha blah blah, blah. oh yes but you know like you said you just taste some and you know it's warming <laughs> right yeah. Yeah, and you can feel experience. what it's doing in your body too. It's moving stuff around. Yeah. You know, your skin get hot. So, you know, with yeah. the blood is, you know, moving yeah. to your, your skin. You can yeah. feel that stuff, experience it directly. And then you remember what you've remembered mm -hmm. more thoroughly because it's visceral. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we've all had, I mean, you can rote memorize stuff to, you know, to the end of the day. And yes, there will be some things you remember, like, Something I had to memorize for my UK citizenship test was the last successful foreign invasion of the British Isles was in 1066 by the Normans. <laughs> I, I wasn't there, at least not that I actively know of. But I, so I remember that and I will never forget that. <laughs> Do I remember much else from that test? Not really. But, you know, if you ask me about lemon balm or lavender, mm -hmm. I could talk to you for hours about right. any herb because... When I'm talking about it, I'm tasting it. I've got that imprint, that memory of the taste in my mouth. So I am tasting it in my mouth and I'm letting the memory of that taste work through my body to keep that memory really physical and really active and really alive so that, you know, I might not keep 100% of every single possible data point about lemon balm that completely ever has been researched or existed or written about in my mind, but a really solid foundation and broader than when you're memorizing and you remember something like, oh, lemon balm's really good for calming the nervous system. Tick. Or you might remember the one factoid Lemon balm, antiviral specific for the herpes virus. Therefore, if somebody's got a cold sore, lemon balm and St. John's wort. And that's all I'm ever going to think about those two as, you know. Mm -hmm. We work with 12 herbs on my course. And as now that we're getting into the messages and we'll go through sort of formulas and remedies, I'll say, okay, this kind of scenario for this, this scenario for that. Let's do our three herb pairing. We've only got 12 herbs to work with. And we come up with all these pairings and we're now at the point in the course where I'm saying to my students, do you see how we've just got 12 herbs, but because we're tasting them, because we're getting to know them really deeply, we're developing relationships. Do you see how you could actually do 99% of what you need to do with these 12 herbs? Wow. And they're like, oh, which of course means it saves space. It saves time, it saves money, it saves, re like, everything, mm -hmm. you know? And then you can explore more, and then you can explore more, but, like, take it one herb at a time. Bite size, literally. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, speaking about taste, it kind of triggered this thought process in me about how a lot of herbalists will formulate herbal medicines for people based on the efficacy of the herbs, based on like the, the knowledge. And then you get this tincture and somebody tastes it and it tastes horrible. <laughs> they don't want to <laughs> take it. And like this brings up like the issue of like herbal compliance because people, 
you know, don't want to taste something that's like repulsive to them, you know? Mm -hmm. And I would love to talk more about the importance of taste in formulation. And maybe you can talk about why taste is important for herbal medicine a little bit more in general. Yeah, sure. So, so if I start with that, and if I don't loop back to your first point, okay. remind, yeah, yeah. <laughs> remind me. <laughs> but uh, there are so many aspects to the plants, and you can find lists and lists and lists and lists of, for example, anti antimicrobial herbs. Here's fifty herbs, right? Mm -hmm wound healing herbs, vulnerary herbs, her here are 50 herbs, nervines, herbs for the nervous system, here are 50 herbs. And you sit there going, how do I choose which one of these to use? And you know, you think, oh, well, I've been learning this one. This is a nervine. This person's stressed out. I'll give it to them. But what you don't realize is it's a stimulating nervine. Mm -hmm. And now that person is not thanking you and saying herbs don't work. And then, you know, the budding herbalist feels that they've, you know, done, they've brought shame upon the plants. <laughs> so yeah. taste is really, really important in working with the herbs, getting to know them, and in formulation. And we often call it organoleptics, where it's understanding the actions or the, the do, what it's going to do, of the plant based on the taste. So there are seven different tastes that I work with, different traditions give kind of slightly, somewhere between five and seven, seven different tastes. And there are, of course, nuances within these tastes, but mm. each of these tastes let your body know that that automatic cascade I talked about before, they trigger a conversation in your body that then kicks off a process. So when you're thinking about formulating, if you take a step back from the intellectual, you know, black and white of oh, this person has an infection, so I'm going to give them an antimicrobial herb. Take a step back to taste and then to the qualities of that taste and you'll get to, you'll get a little arrow that says, oh, over this way, towards these, you know, herbs. And suddenly instead of 50, you've got maybe five. And then you've got one of those in your home apothecary and you go, okay, that's the one I'm going to use. Or maybe you've got two and then you sort of, you know, give it a bit of intuitive feel. So, for example, the aromatic pungent herbs, they are, when you taste that, they're antimicrobial. They're usually warming, but some of them are cooling. You know, you've got fennel, for example, is cooling. Peppermint, I feel personally in my experience, depends sort of on the person and the day, whether it's cooling or warming or, the, you know, the way that it's prepared versus, you know, rosemary, pretty much always warming. <laughs> Very definitely warming. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking, right, somebody's got an infection, you taste an aromatic pungent herb, you know it's got those antimicrobial properties. That means the body's going to start working with that. Why? Because it's rich in volatile oils, which is what gets distilled and then skimmed off the top and bottled up as essential oils, mm. which is a particular spectrum of constituents in the plant, many of which are antimicrobial. So those are very rich in these aromatic pungent herbs. That's why we're getting all that smell. So the brilliant thing about working with taste is you've got somebody who's just starting with herbal medicine. They've got, you know, a couple of pots or a small patch of a few culinary herbs growing in their garden. And, you know, they might have some calendula, they might have some rosemary, they might have some chamomile, what have you. Somebody gets an infection and they go, right, I need an aromatic pungent herb. Nibble, nibble, nibble your garden. Okay, this one. It also means it doesn't matter which culinary herbs you've got in your garden, or if you're not super familiar with them, if you taste one, obviously one that you know is safe to ingest, to, you know, must be said, don't put anything in your mouth unless you know it's what it is and it's safe to ingest. We're not the early humanoids. We've got that information now. Um, but taste it. 
you get that anti that antimicrobial taste. Well, for me, it's antimicrobial. You get that aromatic pungent taste. Oh, right. This can help with an infection. And then you can work it into a medicine. So it gives you, in the one sense of focus, because it gives you a clear sense of these are the components that I need to incorporate to support somebody to bring them back into balance. And on the other hand, it broadens your ability to work with more herbs before you, you know, sat down with your quill and candlelight and, and done an intensive, you know, academic study of them. Because you know, oh, this will work. You know, you're out walking in the hedgerows. You need, you know, something comes up. You need something. You identify something. You nibble it. Taste. Right. I know what this is going to do in the body. Now I can use it. So it just makes things, I think, more practical, more tangible, more, more actionable. Yeah. So when I'm doing a a broader formula, you know, when I, for the, the few private clients that I see, when I'm formulating for them, I go into my apothecary, especially if it's a new formula, a new client. And I just stand in there and I look at all the different, you know, the bottles and the, you know, dried herbs and whatever. And I, so that they're in front of me, I'm in their presence. Mm -hmm. And then I just feel, this is going to sound weird, feel into my mouth. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I just, I let the tastes come up because wow. I know which tastes someone needs mm -hmm. to bring them into balance. And then because I, I learned, I first learned through, okay, here are seven teas of individual seasonal herbs tastes. I learned through this gateway of organoleptics. Mm -hmm. So that's imprinted. So I go, mm, okay, right. We need bitter. And then I look kind of at the bitter herbs and I sort of feel into the taste and then I'll get the taste of dandelion coming up for example or mugwort or you know I mean those are like two very different use cases but I'll get those tastes coming through mm -hmm. or if I've got you know you've got the your core your core three and maybe your sort of two you know supporting supporting characters and then you just want that last one or two little energetic pinch of something Top notes, sir. The top notes. And then you just stand there and go, mmm, rose, or mmm, lemon balm, mm -hmm. or mmm, you know, something, mmm, a touch of this splash of St. John's War or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a really sensory way of doing it. Now, of course, that is backed up with my relationship with each of the plants. Yeah. yeah. And I, I balance that because it's all about balance, right? I balance that with the intellectual knowledge that I've acquired over the years and that I've, I've meshed in and sort of you know, imprinted onto that imprint of taste. So, you know, you have a conversation with somebody, you, you, you get a holistic picture of what's out of balance in their body. And you've already got a sense of, okay, we're going to need some bitters here. We're going to need some warming here. We're going to need some of this and that. So I've already got a bit of a sense, but I, I love going in and just formulating by taste. And that also helps me. I, I do warn people, you know, this will taste medicinal. And they're like, <laughs> okay, you know, they're kind of, they're like expecting, like, if it doesn't taste nasty, then it's not going to work. Right. But mm -hmm. there is a line, <laughs> like you said. Yeah between medicinal and I'm not swallowing that. I remember like really early on before I started properly training and I got my hands on, so I, oh yes, garlic, antiviral, brilliant antiviral and, and, you know, great for the gut microbiome and all of these things. Yes, I need that in tincture form and that I gave somebody, <laughs> oh my God, confessions of an early herbalist yeah. <laughs> back in the day. I gave someone, oh my God, a blend <laughs> and it had more than a splash of garlic tincture in it what was i thinking and then like just way too way too many this is before i started probably training way too many herbs 
So needless to say, it had a laxative effect because many, many herbs are bitter and have that effect. And it tasted horrible. And her husband wouldn't go anywhere near her because she stunk of garlic. <laughs> and she was like, she was very kind, but she was like, maybe we could change the mix a bit. Uh -huh. That's good. And I was like, sure, we could yeah. do that. I did once give somebody, oh, I once gave somebody a blend that had a small amount of myrrh tincture in it, which we all know tastes like licking the inside of a church. Not that I've done that personally, but, you know, <laughs> I went to Catholic school. I'm very familiar with this smell, <laughs> which gets into your mouth somehow. Right. And because uh, I knew that she specifically needed it. And she said, <laughs> she said it was rank, but she took it. And I gave it to her because I knew that she she would she would still take it. She's pretty hardcore. She could handle yeah. it. You know, I wouldn't mm -hmm. give that to just anybody. <laughs> Plus, obviously, you wouldn't want to use much of that anyway because of sustainability issues. But yes, taste is important. It doesn't have to taste like you're, you know, licking a, a meadow of beautiful flowers. Mm -hmm. But it also needs to be ingestible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But striking that balance. But yeah. taste is a wonderful diagnostic tool that we have if you can if you've developed it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, so what are the seven tastes? So there's bitter, which I've alluded to, astringent, salty, which is not like table salt. It's more like the taste of green, which it's makes terrible. sense when you taste it. Yeah, and you're like, mm, this tastes green. This kind of tastes like grass, like spinachy. You know, it tastes mm -hmm. like tastes like green, salty. There's aromatic pungent. Some traditions separate the two. Some combine them. I tend to sort of teach them together. Mucilaginous, which isn't expressly a taste, but it's a very distinct texture. So I classify it as a taste. Mouthfeel. Mouth feel. I, I usually, <laughs> my students know that I'm sort of an endless font of ridiculous analogies, but hey, they're memorable and you learn, right? So I usually explain mucilaginous as that sort of taste as if you've, you like licked a slug. <laughs> they're like slimy, <laughs> slimy gloop. And then of course, nobody wants to have their marshmallow root tea. And I'm like, no, go on. It's really nice. It's not really like a slug, I promise. And then sour and sweet. And of course, sweet, sweet is not like sweets, like, you know, sugary or not even actual sugar, but just, you know, hyped up artificial stimulate certain centers of the brain, you know, chemical sugars is kind of the state of, of most things. But like a sort of neutral, earthy, whole taste. Mm. That tends to be the root herbs, like the marshmallow root, yeah. or the 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 ashwagandha, yeah. or the shatavari. A lot of those lovely like Ayurvedic root herbs. Mm. I was set, I'm salivating just <laughs> just <laughs> talking about. It. <laughs> and like gin ginseng and the aurelias have, have like a sweet taste to me. Yeah, yeah, and you you know, and some of those roots do have bitter notes. You know, dandelion yeah. roots got sweet and bitter notes in it, so you get the the bodily functions that those precipitate. You get both of those. The bitter taste is usually associated with the liver. So it stimulates bile flow and it kicks off the saliva in the mouth, says to the body, food, nourishment, incoming, rev up the digestive processes. So that all starts kicking off so that by the time you've got food in your gut, it's like it's expecting it. So it starts to work through it. The liver is already processing. So it's going, right, okay, I've got nutrients here. I'll absorb that. I'll send that where it needs to go. I've got, you know, you know, the excess that the body doesn't need to hang on to. I'll process that there. Oh, you know, it's somebody's time of the month. Great, here comes a change in hormone balance. So I'll get this where it needs to go and I'll get that where it needs to go. Or, hmm somebody's feeling angry we need to process and digest this emotion you know it's all of this digestive stuff going on which then funnels all the way down to the end of the digestive system with usually some degree of laxative effect 
So dandelion root will definitely do that for you. But it's also got that root, that sweet component to it. And the roots, think about, you know, we're in autumn now. Root, veg, nourishment, grounding, yeah. earthy, you know, and it's, they come, they, they, they come to a point where they're able to be harvested in the autumn because the plant has done its little seedling thing. It's become a flower. It put all, you know, then it put all its energy into making the flower. And now the energy is turning inwards, storing that nutrition and energy to have enough oomph in it to then come back again the next year. So all of the nutrients, all the energy is down in the roots. And when do we need heavy grounding nourishment at the cold times of year when the cold you know the north wind doth blow you know mm -hmm. and the winds are blowing us around vata's kicking around and everybody's going oh my god what is this <laughs> give me some sweet potato give me some potatoes <laughs> give me carrots and parsley mm -hmm. all the, yes the root soup and the the stews and you know all of these nice sweet obviously you know squash grows above the ground but it's it's sweet mm -hmm. so You've got that nourishment as well. Well, dandelion is what I find fascinating about dandelion is the root is laxative, the leaves are diuretic, but when you get a prescription diuretic, an allopathic diuretic, because it's flushing out the system, you're losing a lot of potassium with it. And the body needs that balance of potassium in order for the entire cardiovascular system and then through to the kidneys, the urinary tract, everything to function properly. And obviously you don't mess with the function of the heart. You want to preserve that and support it. So allopathic diuretics are typically prescribed with synthetic potassium supplements so that somebody doesn't get into a dangerous state of imbalance. Well, dandelion is naturally nutrient rich in potassium. Thank you, Mother Nature, for putting everything together in a ready to eat package. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sweet. Pretty amazing. Yeah, exactly. So you've got all of that together. So you get different tastes combining in each herb. So yeah. you get the different qualities and the, the physiological processes that that kicks off combining in each herb. And it's getting to know the nuances of each herb's taste. Yeah. That helps you understand the the really specific way it's going to have that conversation with your body to then have that chat and get that support for yourself. Yeah. So I, I love how we're looking at bitter and sweet and they're very complementary and opposite. Yeah. But I... In, in my day-to-day -day life, I often find people confusing bitter and astringent. Like I'll, I'll have a persimmon and they're like, oh, that's kind of bitter. I'm like, no, it's astringent. <laughs> mm. in your mouth. So do, could we go into a little bit about astringent and how it differs from bitter and, and other? Yeah. And we, you know, we, we're not used to the bitter taste nowadays for the most part. Mm. It's a taste that's got kind of like, ooh, bitter, bad, you know, that's, right. ooh, we don't want to taste that. Let's make everything sweet, for example. <laughs> so astringent is less of a specific taste than a sensation in the mouth. It's a... Right. It's the opposite yeah. of demulsant. It's the opposite of demulsant. It's tightening. And a lot of people will be familiar with, you know, oh, yes, I'm going to put this astringent toner and I'll put it on my face and it will tighten my pores, right? Yes, exactly. So think of it as tightening the pores, tightening the mucous membranes. And if you think about... If you think about, for example, like a leather water pouch, say, you know, I'll paint a picture. We're in the desert. We're on camels. You know, Queen of Sheba theme music is playing. <laughs> and you've got your leather water pouch. Now, you're not going to go traipsing through the desert with something that's going to be leaking your water supply. So you're going to make sure that that's going to retain the water. But... They are not, you know, they, they don't have any plastic on them. They're not even stainless steel, you know, plus I think if you handled a stainless steel, you know, water bottle in the middle of the desert, you would burn yourself. <laughs> that would not be a good idea. But you've got this leather, well, leather is skin mm -hmm. that's been exposed to 
astringent plants and other natural substances. I know there are chemical versions that people can use these days, but tannins. traditionally. Yeah. Yes, tannins, exactly. The tannins, that's the compound in there, which comes from this tradition of tanning hides to turn them to leather. So it's astringent. It tightens the pores of the skin and tightens the pores of the skin. And if you've ever seen leather in its different stages, first, it gets really hard, 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 hard and inflexible. So, ooh, those pores are really tight. Mm -hmm. But as it continues to go through this process, it starts to get more flexible and more supple. It's kind of like when you start doing yoga at first and you're like, oh, it's really tight. Oh, it's really stiff. But then the more you do it, the more flexible you get. And then you're like, oh, I feel good, right? So it starts to get more flexible so it can expand and contract without getting holes in it or tearing or breaking. And that means it can hold the fluid that it needs to hold. So you end up being more, more moisturized in the long run. So imagine that's your stomach and think about how many people have got leaky gut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got holes in the gut tightening up. So you combine vulnerary wound healing sweet herbs mucilaginous herbs with your astringent ones so you're coating and soothing and tightening 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 to close up those holes and then ultimately get more flexible so in terms of the immediate in your mouth taste astringent is going to give you that tightening effect and then salivating will come after because you'll go ooh tight, right, we need to get some moisture in here. Bitter, and it depends on what, you can do this experiment at home. Go for something that's properly bitter, you know, have some fresh burdock leaf. That was my, you know, herbalist introduction, never forget it moment. Have some fresh burdock leaf. What I often do with the my wormwood. students. So yes, yeah, I usually, I usually give people wormwood. We're on a wormwood mm -hmm. cleanse right now, so. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> bless you both. Know, right? Wow, <laughs> yeah. Straight for the wormwood, which, of course, which has its, its a very specific bitter taste, which is the thujone, which lets us know it's specifically antiparasitic. Mm -hmm. So you've got these top level tastes, but then you've got all the nuances underneath. So bitter, go for a herb, like go look it up. This herb is very bitter, right? Go taste it. Mm -hmm. You will know the bitter taste. It may also be drying. Mm -hmm. like astringent will feel which is a quality mm -hmm. drying versus moistening warming versus cooling relaxant versus tonic well maybe that's why people associate bitter with astringent is the drying effect overlap yeah so there's a difference between the quality drying and the bitter taste yes yeah, very important mm -hmm. i i whenever i try to explain uh, astringent to people i tell them to imagine a tea bag that is steeped too long and that mm. tastes like black tea. Yeah, black tea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Puckers your mouth. Yes, exactly. It's drying, it's tightening, but it, it's not like it's got a specific flavor to it. Yeah. Whereas right, bitterness right. has a flavor to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And then sour kind of has some overlap too with the stringent sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you explain sour to people or yes yeah, so sour yeah so sour's got that tightening puckering effect as well and that's when we when we do the taste I usually talk about we explore the taste and then we say okay does this taste tend to there's a spectrum of course does it tend to be warming or cooling does it tend to be drying or moistening does it tend to be tonic or relaxant so we we give the nuance of quality in there as well so sour yes it feels tightening and puckering yes it feels drying but sour tends to be the berries so you know which you've then got the reds and the blues and the purples of the colors of the fruit which is then indicative of the flavonoids in them which then gives us the sour taste so the sour taste is, I usually explain to people, it's kind of like that berry taste. Not like a strawberry, which is quite sweet, but think of like, you know, a nice tart blueberry or, you know, blackberries or brambles. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be full-blown lemon mm -hmm. caliber, 
but it's that sort of tart berry flavor. That's where you get apple. the sour. Yes. Apple sour. Yeah. Apples can be, yeah, exactly. Because then you think about, for example, Shizandra. Mm, yeah. Which is a berry and yeah. it's red and it's sour. Oh, you know, I'm I'm very much pitta and I love the taste of Shizander. I'm like, I could, I, you know, and of course it'll just make you go anyway. And then it's antiviral as well as you're like, yes, I can keep going. And this is like too, too much excitement for an already excited pitta person. <laughs> <laughs> but Shizander is a great one to, to get familiar with the taste of the, that sour taste or rose hips. I mean, they've got sweetness in them as well, but yeah, that's that sour quality is really nice. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the sour, I mean, all the, the berries and fruits also have some sweetness to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can't even think of, well, things like oxalis, I guess that's a leaf. Yeah. Those are, these even still have some kind of sweetness to them. Yeah, if you think about with, with berries in particular, the... I mean, the whole point of a, a berry in the broader context of, of, you know, the other of the ecosystems is it's carrying the seeds. It's a it's a reproductive it's in the fruiting body. It's for reproduction. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be a particular color so that animals can see it mm -hmm. and be attracted to it. It's got to be sweet and tasty enough that they'll want to eat it, but not eat too much per bird or whatever in one go so that as many birds for example as possible will eat the hawthorn berries or the, you know what have you and then they will go and spread the seed so yeah. that's where you've got that balance of it's sweet but sour so tasty but not so have it won't have too much per per bird per person <laughs> so it gives you that natural Limit. communication through yeah. taste yeah of limit which a lot of us you know have just way lost that marker in the, in the sand you know like this to, you know when you get those really hyped up artificial sweet tastes it's just ping it's literally designed in a lab to just ping stuff off in your brain mm -hmm. and you you can't stop mm -hmm. whereas if you eat a if you eat an you know even the down to the difference of eating the fruit itself versus making a smoothie which is not a naturally occurring, <laughs> the right, the things that, that can get combined into smoothies that would never meet each other in the real world <laughs> on their own. <laughs> the, who are you? Oh, who are you? Right. Okay. I guess we're doing this or, you know, or juicing because then you're removing the fiber. Why is all of that just like with the dandelion? Why is it all packaged together like that? So you get what you need and you know when to stop. Yeah. So what does, uh, sour do in the body so sour is really rich in we mentioned flavonoids so we've got that nourishment that vitamin c so it's supporting the immune system it's supporting the quality of the blood um and those compounds are also really supportive of cardiovascular health you know, a lot of the kind of, you know, you see the, the superfoods and it's the goji berry this week or not that I have anything personally against goji berries, you know, <laughs> but you, they, they quite often they're berries or, or roots that people then want to consume excessive amounts of, which again, we, we don't need to do. Why are these perceived to be superfoods and these fountains of youth and these, these invincible things? Because your heart health is really central to your longevity. So they're really nourishing and supportive to the heart. They help the cardiovascular system. They help the blood flow. They help the blood be clean, for lack of a better word. So, so healthy rather than, you know, getting gunked up with lots of, you know, ama and stickiness that's just kind of wanting to then coagulate. You know, if you've not got sufficient oxygenated blood flow to the brain you're going to have difficulty focusing and you're going to have difficulty with memory you know if you've not got blood going to the fingers and the toes you're going to get cold and then it's going to be painful and increasingly painful so supporting and you know the 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 tone and the function of heart when you get that sour taste you know the, the antioxidants you mm. know that you've got that 
that goodness in there. And again, when is the, what season is the sour taste predominating in? Autumn, depending on where you are in the world, maybe early bits of winter. You know, the tradition of you don't harvest the rose hips till after the first frost, you know, whole thing. Well, but summer that's too. Summer too. Yeah, so the, the, the sweeter fruits then, but especially, you know, the... The ones that we, the the herbal berries uh -huh. that we think of like properly as herbs, Medicine, you know, yeah. yeah, the medicinal ones, like the hawthorn, yeah. okay. you know, starts to come out around autumn time. Well, we need that circulation to be really supported and keep that going in the colder times of the year. So it's, a, I mean, we could, we could go off on a whole other conversation about which seasons where um do we find different tastes growing in when is that when they're they're at their peak and then looking at is that the best time of year to work with them you know right. there are some contexts when you you know you're working on supporting the body overcoming a long-term thing with specific herbs that you know are really supportive and so you'll create a formula you create a home remedy and you'll work with that consistently for a long time. So of course it makes sense. Just like we preserve, you know, our summer abundance so that we can eat it in winter. Yes, mm. you'll make tinctures or you'll dry herbs, what have you, so you can have them throughout the year. But if you're not working on something like that, you know, sweet herbs in the summer, is that really the most supportive time the most conducive time to be working with them. Cooling bitter herbs in the dead of winter, mm. you know, not a great time unless you really specifically need that for something specific. Yeah. So going back to those early humans and observation, observing when do certain herbs grow? What tastes have they got? What are the seasons? Isn't this the most supportive time to be using it? We know like cleavers come up, early spring yes they're cooling things are starting to get a bit warm and we need to you know wash the body through after after the winter that's when we work with them we don't really i mean you like they're not up in the middle of winter so you can't work with them and they're not the best you know they don't translate yeah. the best as a tincture or even drying oftentimes yeah. like they're best fresh right yeah. mm -hmm. A lot of those because, spring tonics are that way, yeah. Exactly, because they don't want to be used throughout the year because so, most people don't need them throughout the year. And so it seems like those spring tonics have a lot of the salty taste. Mm -hmm. So could we go briefly into the salty taste and how what 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 that what that purpose of that is? Yeah, so the salty taste is really, really, really rich in minerals. So that's why people will say, oh, it tastes like green or it tastes like grass or it's a bit spinachy. So think of your, you know, your nettles. Perfect example. Yeah. I mean, mineral after mineral after mineral, incredibly nourishing for the body. And at the same time, diuretic, cleansing, flushing things through. So what, I mean, the wisdom of that plant, knowing that we're flushing things through but we're not depleting because we're remineralizing as we flush through. It's just, I mean, do you know, if a human being had to sit down and create that, we, yeah. I don't think we could, you know, I often say our mind is the, the least intelligent parts of, part of our body. If you gave somebody a blank piece of paper and said, right, come up with an amazing heart. I mean, you just like nature would just surpass us every single time every single time and you just have to look at nettles for that so yes yeah, salty tastes really mineral rich and there aren't it's not the big taste it's not the biggest one yes we need the minerals but we don't really need if we're in balance if we if we're you know which is easier said than done but yeah we don't well, need loads of that you well, know, all these trends of like, flush it through, detox, detox, detox. Well, we've got to nourish as well. If you keep mm -hmm. detoxing, you're just going to waste away to nothing. Right. Yeah. But, and they're also, you, you, I think that the mineral herbs are more important now with how mineral deficient m most food is. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think also like we try to eat greens every day, especially in the spring and summer. Mm. Um, and fall <laughs> but 
Well, and winter. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but definitely the spring, you know, when yeah. there's a lot of greens. More variety, I guess. But uh, people don't do that anymore. But we used to always do that. Greens were always a part of our daily food. And mm. that is how one of the ways we got a lot of our minerals. And also a lot of the vegetables nowadays don't have as many minerals in the, in them because the soils aren't don't have the Depleted. minerals. Depleted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And which is it's frustrating because even even if you're but we have a small holding ourselves because we're trying to grow as much of our own food as possible and and nourish the soil because you can buy organic food which brilliant it's not been sprayed like other foods are sprayed but what's the quality of the soil yeah. what are the minerals in the soil is it i mean there there have been all kinds of studies done about how the food that grows now is significantly lower in minerals than a generation ago, two generations ago, because we've just been overgrowing, over farming, overgrowing, over farming, plus anything else that's getting sprayed or modified or, or whatever. So yeah, the, I mean, those nettles, man, they will like, yeah. They will. I mean, if you've ever tried to get a nettle out of your garden, <laughs> you know those roots and you know they are digging into every crevice of the earth to find mm -hmm. the minerals and get it up into that plant. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. totally. You know, the, the day that we start getting really lackluster nutrient, mineral, mineral poor nettles is the day that the earth and humanity is in serious trouble yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I guess then there's really nothing up. left <laughs> yeah yeah so i have a question about taste and our aversion to certain tastes or our desires for mm -hmm. certain tastes like i don't know if you know the answer to this question <laughs> or if i could ask it really coherently but you know if we really like the taste of shizandra for example is that an indication that our body needs it or not necessarily? And like, sometimes we might find like people have an aversion to bitter taste, but that's what they really need. Like, do you have any like observations about that over the years? Yes, this is, this gets the answer that is my student's favorite answer. It depends. <laughs> and they all go, okay. oh, of course it depends. But I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it depends. There are sometimes, you know, people will have an instinct and even if they don't, they're not consciously aware that it's an instinct, people will, you know, there'll be times when people will go to their, their kitchen cupboards and they'll have, you know, they're like a couple different herbal teas that, you know, they maybe even buy from the shop. They don't have to home make it or whatever, right? You've got your, your tea selection and they're just, you know, mmm just really, really want this like nettle and peppermint and fennel one tonight. Mm. Do you know, I really want it to, you know, the next night, oh, I really want it tonight too. Oh, I really want it tonight too. And they'll, they'll keep drinking that tea over and over for a period of time where they're like, oh, I just really want rosemary on my dinner tonight. Oh, I really want it on tonight as well. Oh, you can't get enough of it. And people think that they have just like, they're just in a, in a phase or in a funk, you know? And then there'll come a point where they don't want it and they think, oh, I've either just like overdone it or I've got bored, which I think is a very, it's a way of thinking about taste that we've been conditioned to adopt with all these artificial flavorings and, you know, exciting manufactured tastes. So- Yeah, our whole taste situation is totally thrown out off. Out of whack, by, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So, and smell as well, which is linked into to organoleptics. You know, it's quote unquote fresh linen smell that you get on laundry detergent. Oh I mean, God. Don't, don't even get me started. Don't no. even get me started. I can, <laughs> I can smell it from a mile away and I will run yeah. the other direction. It I don't genuinely, know why people like that smell. It just, it it's makes like me so feel chemically and, Ill. It's really, yeah. you know, it's not nice. And it's endocrine disrupting and it's going on yeah. your largest organ, which is your skin, which absorbs directly into your bloodstream. There's a whole other conversation, <laughs> other conversation. <laughs> but I'll just stick that in there as food for thought in case anybody wasn't already thinking it. Yeah. So what's actually happening with that process is your body is communicating to you. I have a need right now for certain support. 
you're meeting that need because you're craving that taste, you're wanting that taste. And when your body's satiated with that taste in terms of the support that it's gotten from it, you won't really want it anymore. Mm. That's the healthy version of that. Yeah. Or the, 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 you know, listening to the, the genuine messages of your body's version of it. Then there's the bit where, like we were saying, we, we're so used to exciting, hyped up synthetic tastes mm -hmm. that there's something you think, oh, I really want more of this because I like it and it gives me a buzz. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Or, oh, I really want more and I like it because it numbs me. Mm -hmm. This I I see that a lot with with gluten actually, people who like really aren't enjoying what they're doing in life or a certain circumstance, or they're just they're just not feeling fulfilled, but they feel like they can't get out of that situation, and they know that they can slow their bodies, whether it's intellectually or just the way they feel. I can slow my body and my brain down with some cookies or some bread, you know, and you sometimes go, oh yeah, but you know, it's, I've gotten some organic sourdough bread, but if your gut really doesn't like it, if it's not able to, to process it at that point in time, it's going to slow you down. So people can, you know, you can numb yourself with a loaf of bread. <laughs> which is not as sexy and exciting as probably some other things you could do that with, but you know, <laughs> will damage the body, but not in the same way. It's probably not. Well, depends how far it goes anyway. So there are tastes that we, we want because they're exciting and there are tastes that we resist because we're used to associating those tastes with unpleasant things. Whether it's, ooh, bitter taste, yuck, ah, that's unpleasant. You know, there are some actual, you know, instinctive tastes and smells that are on the, uh, on the spectrum of repulsive. And that's for a reason. That's for our, like, right. biological, pr you know, don't eat that because it's putrid, right? Like nobody smell. Yeah, it might be poison or it might be toxic. It will, it will, you know, cause harm. Yeah. So don't feel like you need to push yourself to, you know, eat something that's decaying and moldy, right? It's like, <laughs> unless it's a really nice, you know, blue cheese and it's been made that way on purpose. It's a different story. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we, we, there's this fear an aversion to being uncomfortable because we've got so used to all kinds of products and pills yeah. and circumstances and whatever that can make us feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So we're not used to, you know, if you've got medicine and it tastes bad, okay, if somebody is a new herbalist and they've given you like 50%, it wasn't 50%, but if they've given you a lot of garlic tincture, right? That's human error, okay? <laughs> and fair enough, like you don't need to drink that. <laughs> don't torture just... yourself. Put some on some like pasta or if you, you know, <laughs> yeah. pasta. If you don't need easy, garlic tincture, put more. it in your food. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Pickle your garlic and eat it that way and it's very yeah. tasty. But we, we, we don't like being uncomfortable. Yeah. So when the medicine is bitter, but that's what your body really needs, is it that and this, this is where, you know, you've got to kind of do the work to listen to your body, tune into your body, really understand your body's messages. Because your body will tell you, don't take that, that's going to make me feel sick, or that's going to make me unwell, or I don't like that but I know it's going to support me to get back in balance. It's not tasty, but it'll support me to get back in balance and I'll feel better afterwards. It's yeah. the, to give a kind of really crass example, which you can work with herbs to support in the process or not. I think everybody knows the feeling of like, when you need to be, you need to be sick. You know, the old expression better out than in. Yeah. And there's sometimes there's that fear of like, Oh, I don't want to be sick. I don't want to be sick. Uh, uh, uh. But you know, 
as soon as you get it out, you're going to feel better. Right. So it's all part of that process. Can you meet your body at the threshold of, it's going to make me feel a bit uncomfortable and I know that I'll feel better afterwards. Or is it something that's genuinely putrid that you should not ingest? Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about in my own life, like I used to think ashwagandha smelled like like, I don't know, like feet or something. Uh -huh. like I was kind of averse to it. And then I went through this like really stressful time in my life and I couldn't get enough ashwagandha powder. Like I was mm -hmm. just like, bring it on every day and it, it made me feel better. And so it's interesting how maybe your taste can change too, as yeah. like you said, it depends like what your body needs and every mm -hmm. person's different. Cause like ashwagandha might have worked for me really well, but I try to go give it to someone else and it's like not the herb for them. And mm -hmm or in a similar stressful situation or whatever. So yeah, I think that it depends answer is very wise. <laughs> it depends <laughs> with most things, which is why you, you build a relationship with your body. If you mm -hmm. want to support other people, you, you develop that understanding of how bodies work beyond, you know, the kind of like pink and beige muscle cutaway diagram type things, mm -hmm. anatomy and physiology things, which mm -hmm. have their place, of course. And you build a relationship with the plants. It's like getting to know a person, whether you want to go full blown, like personify them, or you want to have a whole plant spirit journey, or you just want to like drink a bunch of the tea while you get out your 10 reference books and like write notes with your candle and your quill while you're drinking the tea or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever way you like to do it you know, you meet a new acquaintance. Oh, hi. Then you get to know them. Mm -hmm. Then they're a friend. Mm -hmm. Then they become a partner, a lifelong companion. Mm. And you deepen that relationship so you know who they are. And we, you know, if you look on the, the, the grand scheme of the mega, tree, you can find these online, like the mega tree of life of like all thing all creatures that all living things that exist we're not that far away from plants mm -hmm. you know our bodies have been communicating exchanging in relationship with plants since the dawn of time mm -hmm. versus other substances that are extremely new and our bodies are like what the heck have you just put in me and what am i supposed what do you what do you think i'm gonna do with this what do you think <laughs> I don't want this but you know you like I look out my window now I'm in the English countryside I've got hawthorn and hawthorn and hawthorn and hawthorn like for days mm -hmm. and every time I look out this window I'm like free medicine yeah free medicine obviously you, you know you need to know the plant have that relationship know how to work with it when it's appropriate when it isn't but free medicine no side effects mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's nice to look at too and it benefits the birds because they've got you know habitat to live in and they've got food and they've got the, I mean all of these plants that are haven't been cultivated specifically in you know to to be like the prettiest ornamental rose or whatever some strange unnatural colors or whatever they've all continued their conversation within the ecosystem They've all continued to, okay, how can I be of more service? How can I support better? Oh, maybe next year I'll grow a branch a bit more in this direction because I noticed that, you know, the birds were doing you know, X, Y, Z. They've all continued to be in conversation and none of it makes waste because anything that might be perceived as waste by one part of the ecosystem is then picked up as something useful by the other part. The only ones who have stopped being continually and actively in that conversation and who are making waste are us mm. somehow we lost that message right the hedgehogs aren't trolling around the hedgehog the hedgerows like trashing it right oh yeah I'll just like check this here you know could you imagine like some hedgehog like wah whatever <laughs> i've had a big night out it's fine you know <laughs> versus us who were like doing all sorts yeah but we've been growing except for this short space of recent history 
with the plants, we've been in communication, your body knows what to do with it, you know, just drink the tea. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes consult an herbalist or an outside perspective if you're... Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you need perspective, if it's been going on for a long time and you, you know, you can't work it out, yeah, get support, get a second opinion. You know, we don't all have to be experts in the endocrine system or what, you know, whatever, like pick a thing, you know, there are some people who have devoted their lives to like the kidneys, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Like, yet, yeah, like, you know, converse with those people if you need support with your kidneys, you know? Yes. Yeah. But remember, you know, that is still connected to everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You've still got to feel into, is this supportive? Is this helping me get into balance? Does this not feel right? Does something just feel off? Yeah. You know, keeping in conversation with yourself as well is really important. For sure. So for students who maybe are having trouble identifying like the herb specific taste because there's like several different tastes to different herbs. Do you have any like tips for them to hone their skill of identifying? I'm thinking of like cinnamon, which is like a little demulsion. It's a little warming. It's mm. a little spicy, but it's also sweet. Like, is it okay to just not have one predominant taste? Yeah. Or Ella campaign. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's t it's totally okay. And you can, you know, if you want to practice it, you can, you know, you can look up lists of like bitter herbs, for example, and you could work through that list slowly, taste those different ones. You yeah. know, they're bitter because so working backwards, like, okay, these are the ones that we know are bitter and doing it that way. Yeah. And yeah. then getting a sense of the nuance of the bitterness. And do I taste any other tastes coming, you know, it's sort of like wine tasting, which I'm in yeah. no way trained in, but you know, it's got <laughs> notes of, you know. I bet you would be great at it though. <laughs> Maybe, or I would just like really make it really silly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's got essence of hedgehog, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so get, maybe get a list of bitter herbs, for example. So, you know, as a starting point, it's definitely got the bitter taste in it. And then write down, okay, bitter write down a bit about what what that bitterness tastes like to you because it'll be different to a different bitter herb and then what other tastes do i feel are maybe coming through and you don't have to get them all in one go right like sometimes there are some that's just that really subtle you know a pinch of whatever at the end type thing but you're working with the sort of you want to get a sense of the core tastes of each herb and if you work through one taste at a time, you'll develop your palate for that taste. Or you can do something like one herb, pick one of the bitter herbs that you know is bitter and just work with that for a while. Mm. Then switch to something that is astringent and you know is astringent and work with that for a while. Mm. So you get it really planted. Uh -huh pun intended on you <laughs> yeah. on you know on your tongue then go for a sweet herb one sweet herb really get to know that sweetness then a mucilaginous one and you'll say okay this is sweet but it's also slimy and that one that was sweet wasn't also slimy or as slimy yeah so whichever approach works for you but my general kind of rule of thumb is one thing at a time so mm -hmm. one taste at a time or one herb at a time, or if you're learning to make, you know, remedies, one type of remedy at a time, or one herb many ways. Mm -hmm. mm. Like that. So yeah. it's just, it's just one thing, like, I mean, it all goes back to taste for me, but like, make it bite size. One thing, get mm. to know it, get it in your body. So you know what it feels like, you know what it tastes like. And then when you move on to the next one, you've got something to then You've got a reference point. You've got something to compare it to, to gauge mm. against and start to plot things in your mind, in your body, instead of just, oh, I've got to memorize all these herbs and, oh, they've all got all these Latin <laughs> names and how am I ever going to remember this? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to make this and then I'm going to make that. Oh, I just saw so this really good recipe about this. So I should really do that. And now it's elderberry syrup season. So <laughs> like, yeah. it's too much. It's too much. Mm -hmm. yeah. You won't get it into your life that way. You won't. 
It'll just sit on the shelf or it'll sit in your inbox full of like epic recipes that you never got to. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, good advice. Well, thank you for all of your good advice today and for taking the time to chat with us. This has been really awesome. My pleasure. And if folks want to find out more about you and Roads, Roots, and Remedies, your business, will you tell folks where to, where to go online? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned, I teach workshops across the seasons. I, you can't tell from my accent, but I'm in Yorkshire in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're interested in going on a journey deep into herbal medicine with me and you live vaguely in the area or want to travel, I do do that intensive herbalism course, Awaken Herbal Wisdom. Enrollment for that opens to the waiting list every September. So we are in an enrollment period now, and it's for anybody who really wants to get herbalism into their bones and feel confident working with it in their daily lives. So I've got students who are totally new and really keen. I've got others who are on clinical practitioner training courses, and they supplement to get that really visceral, hands-on mouth on <laughs> um, <Yeah>. ex experience <laughs> nice. that sounded weird but you know what I mean <laughs> I like um, so yeah I mean I can obviously I can share the link for the show notes or people can dm me the word access on instagram and I'm at roads roots and remedies there obviously not everybody is in the UK or anywhere near so if you want to get a taste for the tastes of herbalism then I'll share another link as well and I'll be happy to provide exclusive access to the recording of the first live lesson plus the course book pages from my intensive course that takes you through one taste mm. so you get to work through it it's an hour recording so you get to work along with my students and you'll learn the messages that your body sends that asks you for support with this taste so you can develop that skill of listening and responding as well as get that taste on your tongue and you know then you know if you've got another herb that has that taste okay I can work with it in a similar way because I know what's happening in the body it's just I feel like unlocking that as the master key so i'm really 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 happy to to share that with anybody who's anywhere and just yeah fo follow the link for that okay awesome and for folks who are listening it's roads roots and remedies .co .uk if you want to find megan online and it's spelled r-h-o-d-e not like the not like the road yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so. a good yorkshire name that one so yeah <laughs> <laughs> absolutely well thank you so much again Megan this has been fantastic I appreciate my you my pleasure really lovely chatting with you